In just about any city's history, you could set aside a whole chapter just for the disasters, the fires and the floods, the storms and the crashes, the events of tragedy and upheaval, the bold headlines and special reports. And yet today, a lot of these have been nearly forgotten as old news. And yet some of them changed St. Louis in very significant ways. Disasters fascinate us with their power and their unpredictability. Just when it seems like we've got everything under control, boom, it hits. Anytime, any place. But this is a pretty old picture. Well, it's a it's hundred years old at least. This was at 2706 Allen Avenue. But this is I, four years old. Isa Lee Bishop, 105 years old, and she was there, one of the few people left who remember one of the most terrible days in St. Louis history. This photo was taken just before it hit. The darkening sky above St. Louis on the afternoon of May 27, 1896. It was just after 5 p.m. The twister formed on the near south side and then sliced through the city, moved up along the riverfront, and crossed into Illinois. The destruction on both sides of the river was appalling, and the dead were everywhere. More than 300 people killed because this hit everything. Houses, factories filled with workers, a hospital. The Soulard neighborhood was devastated. This area was particularly hard hit. It was a dense area, it was a compact area populated primarily with working class immigrants, largely German, within a one mile radius of this area over 50 people were killed. This is what the intersection of 7th and Rutger looked like the next day, searching for bodies and any possible survivors that might still be in the pile of bricks and lumber. The Sunday following the twister, there were 200 funerals. The stories were tragic, the bodies of two shop girls found with their arms around each other, a mother with her baby still in her grasp, a boy found on his rocking horse. But there were also the stories of survival, the woman who saved her children by dropping them down the dumbwaiter and then jumping after them. I remember that the woman upstairs came down and was kneeling at the front door, praying. And my grandmother, who was somewhat of an agnostic, said, get away, get away, let me get there. This is no time to pray. She said that. <laughs> my mother told it on her. One fellow was repairing a tin roof on a building on the corner of 4th and Spruce. He saw the tornado coming, and he took refuge in a small shed that was located on the roof. Well, the tornado came, lifted the shed up into the air, spun it around dozens of times, carried him away. The shed hit a building on the uh, corner of 7th and Shoto, and then continued uh, to fly through the air, landed on a roof of a house at Hickory and Ninth. That was more than a mile away. The house slid down the roof, landed on a tree that had fallen down. Uh, the tinner got out of the shed, unharmed, brushed himself off, and walked off to the nearest saloon for a drink. In 1896, St. Louis was a city of telephones and gas and electricity and streetcars, and the storm brought it all to a halt. Only a few details of the great disaster made it out over the few remaining telegraph lines, and the reports around the world were often exaggerated, and it would take days to get word to out-of-town relatives. Another problem, in the hardest hit areas, hundreds of thousands of people were coming to view the destruction. Also, criminals took advantage 
of an opportunity. There are a lot of looters uh, that uh, attempted to steal from the buildings that had been uh, collapsed or ruined. And people and thieves came as, from as far away as, as Chicago and Cincinnati just for the purpose of thievery. And in the aftermath of a big city disaster, big city politics. The wealthy neighborhoods, some said, were getting help faster than the poor. It took a long time for electricity to be restored to the south side. Uh, a mass meeting was, was convened on the south side, and the mayor was hung in effigy. The recovery, the rebuilding, would take a long time. It was one of the most terrible days in this city's history, a long, long time ago, but not so long that it is quite yet out of memory. 101 years later, a little girl grown very old, who was impressed not by a brush with death or by the power of nature, but by the rubble beneath her tiny feet. And when we came back to, to, to stay with somebody, I walked over bricks and that impressed me. The idea of walking on bricks. Isa Lee Bishop would see a lot of changes in the new century. Fire and emergency crews would arrive more quickly than they did in 1896. They'd be better trained, better equipped, and more sophisticated. But their powers are still limited. The Carson Union May Stern Fire in 1962 was a spectacular five alarm blaze in the heart of downtown. All of those men, all that equipment, and it all shows how little they can do when a fire gets out of control, especially in an older building. Now imagine the heart of St. Louis a long time ago, before there was a full-time fire department, and the whole city, as they say, was built to burn. London and uh, Paris and New York and Chicago and St. Louis and uh, San Francisco, all the major cities of the world have had a major fire that almost completely destroyed our cities. Eighteen forty-nine <clears throat> was really the turning point between old St. Louis and new St. Louis. The news had reached of the gold rush. You also had the cholera epidemic which in the summer of 1849 took 7,000 lives. And then in, on May 17th of 1849, you had the, the Great Fire, as they call it, and this area right opposite of where we are at this time went up in smoke. The St. Louis levee was more than just a busy place. It was teeming, bustling. People were in a hurry. Boats were loading and unloading, coming and going. And on the night of May 17, 1849, it was crowded with packet boats. They were tied up side by side by side. One of them, the White Cloud, caught fire about 10 p.m. Fire was always a danger on the boats, and everyone knew it would spread fast. It was soon out of control and spreading to the next boat over. And then the next one. One burning boat was cut loose, but instead of stopping the fire, it made it worse. The boat went bumping down river, touching off one fire after another. When the wind was blowing from the, to the northeast, it was blowing the fire out across the river. But it, when the wind changed and started blowing to the s southwest, and then it, then it started spreading the fire into the city. It was a city crowded with burnable buildings, filled with burnable crates and bales and barrels, and there were the wooden shanties that had been thrown up quickly to house a growing population. In those days, there was no full-time fire department. Instead, there were volunteer companies, rival social clubs. This is one of their parades held just a year before. They made firefighting as much a sport as it was a public service. It was their club, and uh, they operated independently. There was nobody over them. Uh, it, this was a big competitive thing to be the first one there and to get first water on the fire. They would go so far as to cut the other company's hose so that they would be the first to get water on the fire. 
So actually they were a little more destructive than they were constructive in certain ways. That night there was little time for the usual hijinks. The fire companies were overmatched and the heart of the city was burning down and their access to the river and their water was blocked. With a strong wind, the fire easily jumped from building to building and block to block and the cathedral was right in the path. From one of the volunteer companies stepped Captain Thomas Targi, whose story is still told. And Thomas Targi, captain, captain of the Missouri Firehouse Number no. 5, got an idea. He saw that the city of St. Louis was going to burn to the ground unless someone did something. And what he thought to do was blow up certain designated buildings on the periphery of the fire, creating a fire break, hoping that the wind could not blow the embers across the fire break and thus save the remaining part of the city. Captain Targi ran home, gulped down a cup of coffee, and told his wife that he'd be back. Using kegs of powder, buildings were blown up ahead of the fire. The Phillips Music Store was the last one. And a man named Isaac Sturgeon was watching. He saw his friend, Thomas Targi, enter the music store with a powder keg under his arm. There was an explosion, a terrible explosion that blew up the music store. And just as Isaac Sturgeon was about to turn his horse and run from the debris that was falling out of the sky, he heard a thud and looked down and saw there was the severed leg of his friend, Captain Targi. Captain Targi had figured out a way to stop that fire by creating a fire break that night, but he had given his life in doing so. The fire break worked. The cathedral was one of the buildings saved. In the aftermath of the fire, with thousands homeless and out of work, St. Louis rebuilt quickly to serve the westward gold seekers, expanding the levee, widening streets, and building everything out of brick. And it was the beginning of the end for the volunteer fire companies, but they still would not go without a fight. It took them about uh, until 1857 on September the 14th uh, to uh, established a paid fire department and even then it wasn't accepted too well by the volunteers. The volunteers uh, were resented the paid department a little bit but there was a real strong young chief at the time, H. Clay Sexton, who uh, threatened to uh, do great bodily harm to any volunteers that interfered with the paid fire department and he was an imposing figure and he convinced them it wasn't in their best interest. As for Thomas Targi, his friends collected the pieces they could find and gave him a grand burial. Today, his portrait hangs prominently in fire department headquarters, the hero of the Great Fire of 1849. Sometimes a disaster is defined by its scope. A huge area is burned down or flooded. A great number of people are affected. But sometimes they have an impact on the community because of who or what is involved. A landmark is destroyed. A prominent leader is lost. As I got out of the car, a man, a fireman passed me. He said to me, son, aren't you the chief's kid? And I said, yes, I am. He said, you better get up there in a hurry. He said, your dad's been hurt real bad. And he said, I don't think he's going to make it. I was only 17 years old at the time. Joseph Morgan comes from a long line of firefighters. He served as Clayton's fire chief. His father was chief of the city of St. Louis until the tragic Saturday morning in the spring of 43. The Goodwill Industries building at 713 Howard caught fire and it spread fast. The chief's house had an alarm and young Joseph decided to go watch the big fire. It was clear the old building was weakening. Firefighters were still inside and on the roof, and Chief Morgan went up the fire escape to order his men out, stopping to check every floor. There were seven men in, inside the building, and he actually went up there to, to tell them to get out. And there was a, the Rethmeyer Coffee Company is right next door, and he told him, he said, jump on that roof there and go over to the ladder and climb down and get out of here. He said, this building's unsafe. 
So all seven of them did, and uh, they he saved their life, you know. The chief was still on the fire escape when it all came down. His son arrived just a moment later as they were digging him out. He rode the ambulance with him to City Hospital, but there was nothing that could be done. It was, it's hard to believe it's been that long ago. He was a fine man, though. Fine man. Absolutely fine man. Fire Chief Joseph Morgan was a true hero, sacrificing his life to save others. The funeral was huge, one of the biggest the city had ever seen. Among the prominent mourners was the mayor, William Becker, who would make his own tragic headlines later that summer. That disaster took the lives of several local leaders in a single moment, and thousands of people were at Lambert Field to watch a publicity stunt gone terribly wrong. So I was pretty excited, little kid, just gonna go into the eighth grade. I'm out here looking at things that, there weren't very many children, there were some kids. Some kids younger than me were up on the shoulders of their fathers. Yes, it was an assignment. I had only been on the staff of the Globe Democrat a couple of months. And uh, for this event, I was assigned to cover it, the only photographer from the Globe. I don't think anybody anticipated uh, that I should have had some help. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was an assignment, one of my first ones. St. Louis's Robertson aircraft was making gliders here for the war. These films of the gliders were shot later in action. They were throwaway aircraft, used once to get men and equipment behind enemy lines and then abandoned. They would earn a reputation for unpredictability, especially on landings. That day in 1943, it was a chance for St. Louisans to see one of their community's contributions to the war effort. It was a Sunday a warm, sunny day. And I was standing on the steps of the administration building facing east. And the tower made an announcement that the glider was to be uh, boarded and they were to taxi the glider to one of the air um, runways. The Normandy invasion was still a year away, and boosting morale on the home front was part of every official's job. Mayor William D. Becker led a group of distinguished passengers for this demonstration flight, leaders of local government and industry. The routine photo assignment was given to Cub photographer Jack Zert. We did a number of close-up pictures and uh, uh, a few things like that, and then we even went inside the plane, and made pictures of the uh, the passengers seated on either side of the aisle, and uh, we even asked if we could go up with them. Thought it'd be interesting shooting their expressions and things like that, but they wouldn't allow us to take cameras, so who needed that? <laughs> so we didn't go. The glider was towed into the air by a plane. It would then be released and the engineless craft would be piloted down for a landing. It took off and uh, flew quite a distance around, and, it came, and I made pictures of it flying across, and then it was making a sweep coming back, and I wanted to make another picture. At that point, the tow was released, the tow line was released, and the glider was on its own. And almost instantly, one of the wings moved up into a 45 degree angle. Well, you don't know something's wrong even when something's wrong. I mean, you're not thinking about something being wrong. The first thing I thought, and I've heard this mentioned several times in tragic episodes from the past, I thought it was part of the act. And the craft made a nosedive to the ground.
So I decided to, uh, to keep it in my finder and track it till just before it hit the ground. Well, it started to spiral. And at one point, my heart was in my mouth. And I wasn't thinking about the poor people inside. I was thinking about making a photograph. Uh, my heart was in my mouth as the wing turned and pointed directly at me. And I said to myself, well, that's no picture. Uh, I got to get it all the way around before it hits the ground. Well, it did make one more spiral. And that's when I shot. And then, bang, it was on the ground. Might have been a sound similar to an explosion. I couldn't see anything because it was farther out on the field. And yet, uh, the, the tower said that um, there's nothing else we can do here. Please go home. And people, I think, were in state of shock for the most part and um, began to file out. The glider had fallen 2,000 feet in a matter of seconds, no time for anyone to use a parachute. The military confiscated and developed all the photographer's film before releasing it to them. Jack Zert's picture was on the front page of the Globe the next morning and printed all over the country and in Life magazine. For years, I'm the guy that made the picture of the plane crash, and even today I hear that. But uh, that was only the beginning. <laughs> It was a good beginning, but it was only the beginning. There was a grand jury investigation, evidence of poor construction and quality control, but there were no indictments. In City Hall, they placed a memorial with the names, the mayor, the county's presiding judge, the president of the Chamber of Commerce, the head of Robertson Aircraft. But the news from overseas, the invasions and victories would take over the headlines. The glider tragedy at Lambert Field would become a footnote in a much bigger story with a happier ending. Well, the average life of a steamboat was five years, so it either was snagged or caught fire or it exploded. Back in the days of the steamboats, the river was filled with hazards, hidden trees that could pierce a boat's hull, sandbars that could ground it, ice that could crush it. But the boats themselves were hazards as well. There was little regulation over equipment, maintenance, or practices, and having a poorly maintained, overworked boiler was like carrying a powerful firebomb. The Glencoe disaster was one of the worst ever on the St. Louis levee. The Glencoe arrived in April of 1852, pulling in between the steamboats Georgia and the Cataract. People greeting the boat jumped onto the bow, where the passengers and the baggage were already crowded, and the Glencoe tipped forward. This changed the level of the water in the boilers, causing an explosion. And the explosion blew away the cabin on the Cataract, it catapulted people into the air and dismembered them, and the, some of the remains of people were found on the decks of boats around and on buildings across Wharf Street on the top of the buildings. It was just one terrible explosion. About 45 people were killed outright. It was just one of several tragic riverboat explosions of the era, and the causes were both mechanical and economic. Steamboat owners could make a lot of money. They could lose a lot of money. So they wanted to carry as much as they could as fast as they could because they never knew if the boat would survive to make another trip. The very worst riverboat disaster of all involved the St. Louis boat, the Sultana. It is one of the country's worst disasters of any kind in its history, and it is nearly forgotten. It was a greater disaster than the, than the number of people lost on the Titanic. St. Louis Riverboat Captain J. Cass Mason made his mark in the history books, but not the way he thought he would. 
Mason wanted the Sultana to be remembered as the boat that delivered the news to the South. President Lincoln had been assassinated. The Civil War had been tough for business, and now the St. Louis owners of the Sultana wanted to recover their losses fast. Heading up from New Orleans back to St. Louis, Mason was carrying cargo and passengers, but there was more money to be made. Union soldiers released from Confederate prisons could be transported home, and Captain Mason wanted his fair share of the business, and some would say he wanted more. There's a dispute over who was responsible for what happened, but as the Sultana left Vicksburg, the soldiers were packed in everywhere. The boat, licensed to carry 376 people, was carrying six times that many. He was getting $5 a head for every enlisted man and $10 a head for officers. And then on top of that, they had some, uh, some emigrants coming up out of New Orleans. About 200 of those were on the boat and some uh, cabin passengers as well. So they had like close to 2,300 people on the boat. The river was high, the current was strong, and Captain Mason had been having problems with the Sultana's boilers. And he got a little bit above Memphis, about four miles above Memphis, when the boat blew up. It was a massive, horrendous explosion. Private William Crisp of the Michigan Infantry saw hundreds trapped in the flames. The heat was so intense, he said, I thought I should be roasted alive then and there. He was one of the lucky few. No one knows just how many people were killed, nearly 1,700, maybe more, most of them men who had lived through Gettysburg and the inhuman conditions of Andersonville Prison. But they didn't survive the trip home. The whole country would pay the price of the steamboat era that had put speed, service, and commerce ahead of everything else. The steamboats would leave an environmental disaster in their wake. Steamboats burned wood, and they burned a lot of wood. Uh, in 1850, a large steamboat, documents that we've got suggest that uh, boats burned uh, up to 75 cords of wood a day in a 24-hour period, which is enough, is, it's enough wood to build 16 houses. And there were 700, there were over 700 steamboats that were plying the river at that time. They took the closest wood they could find along the riverbanks with passengers often pitching in. Soon, nearly every tree along the river was gone. The banks, the natural levees were weakened and worn down, and the river grew wider, shallower, and even more hazardous. By the 1880s, an average steamboat would run for just 18 months before one way or another, the river took its toll. By the 1880s, Mark Twain mentions that uh, he was aware of a steamboat wreck every mile from St. Louis to the confluence of the Ohio. The disasters of the steamboat age are behind us. The river boats and the river people, those who made it and those who tragically didn't, are long gone. If you seek their monument, look around you. We've all seen the dramatic flood pictures, the river lapping at second story windows, and it's so disconcerting because the water isn't where it's supposed to be. But if we look again, maybe we think that it's the buildings that aren't where they're supposed to be. What makes a natural occurrence, a natural disaster, is the water or the wind, but also the fact that we are in the way. In a river city, there's high water, there are floods, and there are disasters. They call them 100-year floods or 500-year floods. In the big picture, they're no surprise either. There was 1785, 1844, 1903, 1947, 1993. And they've gotten progressively more disastrous, not always because there's more water. There's just more us and more of our stuff where the river needs to go every generation or so. In 1844, the Mississippi River spread out all the way to the Belleville Bluffs. A flood is the one disaster that seems to happen in excruciatingly slow motion. It can be watched and tracked and measured, but there's nothing you can do to make it go away. You can only wait. 
A tornado, on the other hand, comes with a force and suddenness that seems beyond our comprehension. It's over almost before you're even sure that you've survived. A tornado's been described as sounding like freight trains. Well, this sounded like a thousand freight trains. The tornado of 27 cut a gash in the city from Forest Park to Fairgrounds Park. It tore through areas of factories, shops, houses, and schools. Hundreds of children were just settling back into their classrooms after lunch when it hit. You could see the final cloud. Theodore McMillian, now a U.S. appeals court judge, was at Wayman Crow School at Shannon and Bell. Jack Williams was seven years old. He and his classmates had just come in from the playground at Columbia School. Then suddenly we began to hear this low rumbling noise, and the teacher uh, evidently uh, feared something was wrong, and she told all of us to put our heads down on the desk. You know how teachers are, the first thing uh, th that they believe in solving any problem is to put your head on the desk. And I looked out the window and across the street I saw the uh, the roof of the house across the street fly up into the air just like that. A big wooden telephone post, it's a telephone post, came through the window. When that uh, post crashed through the window it was time to get out of there. And we came out of the room which was right close to the uh, the stairwell, but the stairwell had collapsed. And I want to say at this time, this roar of the bricks and the building falling and everything, the stairwell had collapsed and we looked down to a, a gaping hole, no place to go. The children were screaming and some of them had blood on them from cut glasses and everything. Columbia School was one of the hardest hit. Miraculously, no one was killed there, but five girls died at nearby Central High School. After the telephone pole crashed into his classroom, Theodore McMillian didn't wait around. He'd left his new puppies on the roof of his building that morning, and he took off into the storm. Ran up Leonard, came over Easton, down to Webster, and ran up on the third floor. Rushed out on the roof to get see about my dogs. And uh, Lord have a way of taking care of them. The devastation was widespread on Lindell and Olive and Boyle, Grand and St. Louis, and rescues had to be made. And the Melanthe Hospital had been badly damaged and patients had died when the walls were torn away. The Army and the National Guard were called out to control the crowds and to protect the property. Frank Engel was a private stationed at Jefferson Barracks. He remembers the looters being rounded up by the wagon load. Oh yeah, yeah. We had orders to shoot. Well, if anything out of order, if it, if it's beyond your taking care of, this last thing you do is, is to shoot them or or corrupt them one way or the other, you know. But I didn't do. I didn't have to do anything like that. I had no attention to either. <laughs> I could see the people have their home wrecked. They'd want to get back to their home. How do you know who they are, you know? People remember the stillness in the aftermath of the tornado, just as they did in 1896. Things had stopped running, and that night all the lights on the street and in the houses were off, and families huddled together in the darkness of their homes. All of the, all of the power was out for a long time because we didn't have any electricity that night, and uh, we didn't have gas at that time. We had a coal stove, so we were still able to prepare some kind of food. But I remember that that night we had pancakes. The pictures can show the extent of the devastation of the tornado of 1927. But words and pictures cannot recreate the experience, the unforgettable sensation of a moment suspended between life and death. Now that was 70 years ago, and uh, I have never forgotten the sounds of that, the roar of that tornado, and the sounds of the building collapsing and the roar has stayed with me. It's just as vivid as it happened yesterday.
We live in a tornado region, that we know, but city people sometimes think that they happen only in the springtime and way out there somewhere. But three times, tornadoes have hit at the very heart of the city of St. Louis. In the spring of 1896, the fall of 1927, and in the middle of a winter night in 1959. What are the chances of that? Or the chances that 32 years apart, two tornadoes would follow nearly the exact same path? My address was Olive at Boyle, 4255 A Olive Street. And from what I was told, Olive and Boyle was one of the worst areas struck. And so uh, we were right in the middle of it. The tornado of 1959 is best remembered for knocking down KTVI's broadcast tower, for damaging the arena, and not just for smashing the intersection of Olive and Boyle, but for the rebuilding that brought the heyday of Gaslight Square. Well, you know, I was living above Smokey Joe's uh, Grecian Terrace, and I was playing baseball for the Cardinals. That February night, Joe Cunningham was still awake, discussing Bible passages with his roommate. And then all of a sudden, it's 2 o'clock, and 2.04, the tornado came through our apartment. And I honestly, I saw the wall crack and the paint crack, and that's when I dove back in the bedroom. But the, uh, the fireplaces, the gas fireplaces, was shaking. I, I, it scared me. It just completely scared me. When we finally got dressed and went down the stairway, you know, there was a lot of, uh, of, of rocks and, and glass and everything there. And when we went out on the street, then we saw it was like an air raid. In fact, the fear of an air raid was one of the things that was making St. Louis better at dealing with the threat of a tornado in 1959, better than in 1927 or 1896. We interrupt our normal program to cooperate in security and civil defense measures. This was the 50s, and the days of putting your head on your desk were gone. Air raid drills would become disaster drills in all schools. And all the technology and the warning systems developed in the war and the Cold War were being applied to spot approaching storms and to get out the warnings. George Broncato was the area's meteorologist in charge the year the tornado hit. He, uh, at that time, had just installed, shortly before this, uh, one of the first radar used for weather. It was a modified radar that we obtained from the military, and uh, it had been uh, rehabbed so that we could use it for spotting weather. Unfortunately, it didn't make much difference in the 59 tornado. It was a worst-case scenario. Any warnings would go out to a sleeping population, and it was February. Even with today's advanced radars, quick-forming winter twisters often cannot be detected soon enough. It was determined that the tornado actually developed just as as it got into the the St. Louis area, so uh, the population could not be advised in advance. The storm rolled into the St. Louis area. At Hampton and Oakland, Channel 2's tower came crashing down onto nearby apartment houses. Part of the arena's roof blew off, and one of the decorative entrance towers was torn away. They would end up tearing down the other one as well. And at Olive and Boyle, Joe Cunningham surveyed the scene. And all the buildings to the right of us were defaced. And there was a building, it was a little nightclub across the street from us, and they had just let the people out at two o'clock. And that building was completely demolished. The same storm system brought rain and flash floods. For a lot of people, 1959 was a terrible winter. But it can't compare to the terrible winter of 1811, 1812, a whole season of earthquakes. But some of the people that perished were never found, and it's speculated that they, when the earth opened up, they fell into those fissures and then it closed back up on them. So those people will never know what happened to them.
There were literally thousands of quakes and tremors that winter, including the most powerful in recorded American history. New Madrid and nearby settlements were hit the hardest. Further away in places like St. Louis, the damage was significantly less. The Daniel Boone home in Defiance is one of the few buildings left from the days of the quakes. Uh, and the house started to slide, and it slid, uh, we believe, an estimated 10 inches downhill from where it had uh, formerly sat. Now, I would imagine this was probably very terrifying for the individuals inside the home at the time. If the ceiling joists had separated a bit more, if a stone wall had twisted and bulged a little further, the whole place might have come down. The main support beams show how the earthquake shoved the massive stone house across its foundation. The Boone family that were there at the time, Nathan and his family, were so upset that they would not stay overnight in the home until they were sure it was safe. If the land was a dangerous place to be, the river was worse. More lives were likely lost when boats capsized in the cascading and churning waters. And uh, during one of those large earthquakes, a certain part of the bottom of the river was thrust upward. And it sort of created a temporary dam to the Mississippi River, and it threw the water back on itself. And so people tell you the, the Mississippi River went backwards during that time period. And, and essentially that's true. Since the days of the great earthquake, the area has gotten a lot more crowded and a lot more complicated. And the disasters have gotten a lot more costly but there simply wasn't that much here. So it was not a disaster on the same magnitude as, say, the tornadoes of 1896, the flood of 1993, the fire of 1849. However, if an earthquake of similar magnitude should strike the city today, well, of course, uh, it would certainly count as one of our great disasters. Most of the time, we master the natural forces around us. From time to time, the relationship is dramatically reversed, and we are humbled. The true test comes in the aftermath, when we must find ways to apply our technology and our humanity to put things and lives back together. And that may be the real story behind the bold headlines and the special reports. St. Louis Chronicles is supported in part by the Elberth R. and Gladys Flora Grant Charitable Trust. Thank you.